Welcome, welcome one and all. What an absolute joy it is to be here with you with the World Economic Forum's Race to Zero Dialogues. It's a day of industry discussion and we're going to be talking right here, right now about the climate pledge. We're talking not only the grand ambition, but now the grand actions being taken. And this, of course, is a discussion of corporate responsibility. This is a discussion of companies across sectors, across continents, coming together to work towards a more sustainable future. Most notably, of course, the climate pledge striving to be net zero carbon emissions by 2040, 10 years, of course, ahead of the Paris Agreement. This fierce ambition, though, that we see does indeed take working together and celebration. Now is a time amid a health crisis, an economic crisis, a social crisis, to celebrate the great strides, the great steps being taken towards reducing the climate crisis that we also <clears throat> face. Let us take this precious moment to highlight some of the achievements, to celebrate them, to learn from them, and to make sure that we continue to push forward. To set up this discussion with some incredible panelists that I'm lucky enough to be moderating here at Bloomberg, I'm going to now welcome and pass the baton over for a quick moment to Gonzalo Munoz, of course, COP25 Chile high-level climate champion to discuss what he's seeing in the fight for a carbon neutral future. Thanks so much, Caroline. And thanks uh, to the WEF, of course, and mostly to the, uh, the Climate Pledge and Global Optimism for the work that you're doing around mobilizing a business sector that have a capability of helping accelerate the trajectory that we need. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to a particular exciting session as part of the Race to Zero Dialogues. In this case, as I said, focus on the Climate Pledge. Uh, ahead of COP26, we need to build an overwhelming wave of ambition and action from companies around the world to highlight to the world that the transition to net zero is happening and is absolutely inevitable. That is happening also in a much more accelerated way than we were previously imagining. The, the climate pledge is a critical part of this wave of ambition and is one of the greatest uh, announcements and news of this year, even during COVID times. But by bringing together leading companies, but I'm meaning absolutely leading companies to commit to achieving net zero. And this time, this is the point by 2040. So 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement, the climate pledge is demonstrating that leading companies understand the need for a rapid transition and are developing plans to deliver it. They're also understanding that the world is starting to celebrate, acknowledge those companies that are being part of the solution and probably also starting to somehow punish those that are not. One of the most exciting aspects of the Climate Pledge is the potential for companies like, well, I see here Amazon, Infosys, and Siemens, many of which may have interdependent supply chains to work together to deliver the pledges coll collaboratively, to learn from each other, and to share best practices. There is a need and a massive opportunity to bring hundreds of thousands of providers, many of which are SMEs, to also join the Race to Zero. That is an opportunity that we have set. We've set it also through the SME Climate Hub, but also through every single aspect of the radical collaboration that is expressed in the Race to Zero. I absolutely welcome the ambition and action being demonstrated by signatories to the Climate Pledge and look forward to hear how signatories are translating their climate action and their climate ambition uh, into the right implementation around, as I said, the whole value chain all around the world. We are as well as, as champions here to serve you. Let's, uh, let's work together towards uh, the COP26 in Glasgow. Thank you very much. Back to you, Caroline. Well said, Gonzalo. We thank you for your time. And it is one of perhaps the most excitingly named, impassionately named institutions. I love it for it. And it is global optimism, of course, a force behind the work that we are seeing done at the moment. And let's hear now from the leader, the founder, co-founder, Christiana Figueres, of course, who has been a driving force between global work towards a zero emissions future. Christiana, please take it away. You mute, Christiana. Here we go. Thank you. I was just being respectful of Gonzalo. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for the invitation to join you today and how exciting. 
to be out with all of you to be presenting, discussing the climate pledge. That is uh, no less than a pledge to um, prove the Paris Agreement wrong, if you want to say it in a very provocative way, because the Paris Agreement does not agree to decarbonizing by 2040. It says in the second half of the century, it's now being interpreted as 2050. But what we have learned what we have learned since adopting the Paris Agreement is that we were wrong in that day, that actually we have to accelerate. You know, in 2015, the science, the climate science that we had led us to a text that was agreed to by all 195 countries that said, we have to go to well below two or strive to get as close as we can to uh, 1.5 degrees as maximum temperature rise which meant at that time net zero in the second half of the century. But three years later, science came out and said exactly what the small island states had been saying for years. Two degrees is way too high. It's got to be 1.5 degrees. Because if not, the difference between maximum temperature rise of 1.5 and two degrees is two to three times the physical destruction, two to three times the biodiversity loss, two to three times the human misery. So the long-term target can no longer be only 2050. It's got to be before 2050, which is why I am so grateful for the new target of 2040. That is the science imperative. The moral imperative, if we're going to have, by decarbonizing later than 2050, if we're gonna have two to three times the human misery that we would have had if we decarbonize before. We will then be moving into a world of dystopia, of constant destruction, diseases, famine, migration, political strife like we've never seen before. And let's remember those people who will be suffering that are the people who are not responsible for climate change. So the science imperative stacks up with the moral imperative. And then as though that were not enough, the economic imperative, because today we know that not only can we avoid dystopia, but we can build a much better world than the one that we have right now. We can have a world with clean air, clean and cheap energy, um, energy efficiency everywhere, smart transport, regenerated soils and oceans, higher quality of life, jobs. Let me say that again, jobs, jobs, jobs. The ILO has said that if we go to, um, the halving of emissions by 2030, which is the new target of science, we can actually create two, uh, 24 million new jobs by 2030. The new Biden administration has said they can create 10 million new jobs in clean energy in the US alone. So that is where jobs are. That is where the economic recovery post COVID is. And Corporations are already seeing that because those corporations that are putting people, planet, and profit at the center of their strategy, third, triple bottom line with equal importance on all three components, those corporations have actually been performing much better than those that didn't through the stress test of the coronavirus period. So we actually we think that we have two paths and Tom Rivet Karnak and I wrote a book about two different paths. The fact is we only have one path that we can follow, but we have to realize that this period, the decade of the twenties is the decisive decade in which we have to get to one half emissions by 2030. And that means forget about linear progress. That is 20th century thinking. We have to get now to exponential progress on this. And what that means is collective effort. We have to be able to bring corporations together, to bring asset owners together, as in the alliance that already exists, bring bankers together, bring civil society together. This has got to be a collective effort because if it is not, we will only progress in a linear fashion. Can no longer afford that. In order to get onto the exponential path and in many areas we're already there, it's got to be a collective effort such as the one that is emerging under the Climate Pledge. Christiana Figueres, Global Optimism, 
global passion, I think is what she displayed right there. And let's get right to it. Let's talk about that collaboration. Let's talk about that focus on people, planet and profits and the way in which these companies are able to really push that agenda forward. I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists. We have, of course, Cara Hurst, VP Worldwide Sustainability at Amazon. We have Ash Awad, Chief Market Officer at McKinstry. Olivier Bloom, Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer at Schneider Electric. We've also got Boz Vaguez, who's Head of Green Initiatives at Infosys, and Martin Powell, US Chief Sustainability Officer at Siemens. It is wonderful to have you all here with us today. And Cara, Amazon spearheading the climate pledge in many ways. We talk about ambition to action here. Already so many achievements being made by Amazon. I'm thinking the investments in climate focused startups you've already been making, the labeling of your own products in climate friendly ways and means. But let's go back to the ambition part. Let's go back to pre 2020s that Cristiano was just talking about. Let's talk 2019. Cara, why did Amazon set up the climate pledge? Well, Lovely to see all of you here and what a conversation to have um, right now, because I think the climate pledge really represents the ambition and acceleration and optimism uh, that Christiana just spoke about. Um, and for us, it was really a, a culmination of, again, looking at the science and saying, what can we do knowing what the science is telling us now to accelerate the path that we're already on? and to leverage our size and our scale and uh, what we could signal to others to make a difference. So we wanted to make an accelerated commitment. We wanted to make a kind of a doubling down on our optimism that we could do uh, this 10 years earlier and that it was necessary to do that. But we also know that we absolutely could not do this alone. Um, partnership with other companies who are within our global supply chain or working with Amazon as, as partners in all different kinds of parts of our business and or who are leaders in their own industry are absolutely essential. And we felt that because of our size and the way that we are uh, looking across those different industries, the signals that we wanted to send about the products and services that are needed to rapidly decarbonize would be something better done collectively. So that's where the pledge was born out of, a conversation around looking at that accelerated path, looking at the science, looking at the optimism and, and finding partners like Global Optimism who said, yes, this is possible, but let's all do this together and let's bring as many companies as we can into this uh, pledge and community to work together to send those very strong signals that decarbonizing products and services are needed um, investment in natural climate solutions and restoration of land is needed, investment of expansion and access to clean energy is needed and acceleration of, of technologies. So that's where it was really born out of that, that very conversation. And of course, you spent years prior to Amazon, you were working really at, in terms of consortiums, a way of being able to work across platform, you with BSR, with academia, you've been working across government, across NGOs. And I want to speak to that cross government perspective right now, because we've got Martin Powell here, of course, now is Siemens USA, but I know him because he's worked with Bloomberg before, but he's worked with Mike Bloomberg in terms of New York. You've worked also, Martin, in terms of the UK with Boris Johnson when he was in his mayoral role. How are you seeing collaboration going cross corporates, but also working across, therefore, governments, other NGOs, that sort of way? How does collaboration help with the Climate Pledge? Yeah, we're seeing a huge uptake um, with uh, really partnering with local governments. Uh, we've been working with over 70 uh, global cities, uh, looking at their carbon plans, looking at how they can achieve net zero. Um, and I've I've been really encouraged in the last four or five years at uh, how we've been able to think about a combination of both policy, uh, but also technology uh, and uh, implementation through multiple stakeholders that you have in, in big urban environments as, as, as well as across uh, countries. And I've seen uh, real uptake. I've seen um, much more focus on real solutions um, I've seen much more success in pilot and demonstration projects, and, and now the time has come uh, for scaling. And I think this is this is the really interesting part. I mean, I work very very closely with our, our finance group. Uh, we uh, set up an infrastructure platform that's now looking to put big distributed energy projects through a, 
a proper pipeline and, and, and qualify some really major projects and, and start getting uh, schools and hospitals and office buildings uh, across uh, these countries covered with solar distributed energy solutions and really start uh, thinking differently about how we are going uh, to tackle this problem. So it's, it's exciting, it's fun, uh, and being part of uh, this distinguished group is also fabulous. Um, I'm really pleased to see um, a great companies. We all offer different uh, ideas and uh, to work together on this is going to be really, really fun. Let's talk about that energy solution in particular, because we've got Schneider Electric here with us. And Olivia Bloom, your, your perspective in terms of the efforts you're moving towards for carbon neutrality and your operations, many would say electricity is really at the heartbeat of how we can focus on a more renewable future. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. In the case of Schneider, you know, what is very interesting is like many companies in the world, we have been focusing on, on what we can do to make the planet more sustainable as we behave, you know, as a company, what we use to all call CSR in the past, but at the same time, we are part of the solution for our customers. So what we are trying, of course, is to experiment, experiment a lot of things for ourselves first. So like many other companies, we've taken company to, to become uh, uh, carbon neutral across our operation by 2025, for instance, in our case, and net zero by 2030. Uh, look, there are a lot of carbon pledges. So the more interesting part is how we, 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 we get there. And for us, it's really the first commitment is um, really to cut the energy intensity of all our operations uh, everywhere in the company. To do that, we, we focus a lot on our own you know, solution where we basically measure everywhere this energy consumption and how we can progress over time. The second biggest focus is really the, the decarbonization of the electricity consumption. So we are taking the commitment to become 100% renewable by 2030. And using a, a lot of PPA, which where we started a lot in the US, but that we implement now much more in, the, in Europe. And there is something else that we are doing is to leverage also much more microgrid solution, which is still uh, not completely mature everywhere in the world. Uh, but that's also very, very interesting to, to, to leverage those decentralized solution. And last but not the least, the latest commitment we've been taken is our own uh, fleet of vehicle at Schneider Electric where we want really to commit to switch to 100% electrical vehicle by 2030 everywhere in the world. So I'm not talking here, of course, of the individual vehicle of our employee, but the one you know, that are rented by Schneider Electric uh, for the professional activities of, of our employees. So to cut a long story short, we are trying to act at different layers. And, and by doing that together, uh, we, will be, we believe we could be carbon uh, net zero, sorry, by 2030 without a, a, a offset. But again, I want to insist on the fact that it's a lot of experimentation that we are doing and learning, of course, from those experimentation and, of course, learning from many other companies uh, across the world. Yeah, I love that news on the microgrids. It's a really fascinating way to help bring that to small and medium-sized enterprises as well as the large institutions that all of you guys and girls are. Uh, talking of getting into the urban areas, as Martin was just referencing, Ash, let's take it to you because this is at your very heartbeat of what your business is about, building more sustainable buildings, decarbonizing our economy. How are you, how are you seeing the uptake for that? How much is this demand-led as well as supply-driven from your side? Yeah, well, thank you, and good morning or good evening to everyone. I'm not sure where everybody is exactly, but uh, very happy to be joining you all. Uh, well, hey, let me just start by saying one broad thing, and I love the moral imperative. You know, we believe at McKinstry very clearly that there is a climate crisis, and it's literally right around the corner, as uh, Christiana pointed out, that there is a deep affordability crisis that needs to be uh, tackled. The challenge is that if you don't take on the affordability crisis, you actually cannot necessarily solve for the climate crisis. And as we saw in 2020, there clearly is an equity crisis. And so what's interesting is that all three of those issues uh, play uh, uh, against each other or they can play well together. So I just wanted to start there and let you know that the reason we've committed to 2030 carbon neutrality is because we think of it as critical and important. We're so happy to join this climate pledge and very much appreciate Amazon and uh, climate uh, uh, global optimism. Well, in, you know, in terms of the demand, the demand is continuing to be very high uh, to answer your question. You know, we work particularly in the built environment, new construction and existing buildings. I wanna just make a general comment that it's not likely that we can build our way 
out of this climate crisis relative to the built environment. For instance, in the United States alone, there's 88 billion square feet of non-residential consuming 75% of the electricity and producing 40% of the carbon. It's just, we're not gonna replace all of it. And so the idea of going and working with schools and hospitals and trying to find creative ways of dealing with deferred maintenance issues, if essentially failing and aging equipment and systems, putting together a creative alternative financing methods so that they don't have to come up with the capital, creating return on investment portfolios and approaches so that maybe other financiers want to use their money to come in and actually finance the projects. We're seeing more and more of that, a lot of patient capital sitting on the sideline wanting to do this work. And so uh, when you couple that with this kind of desire and drive to completely decarbonize the built environment, we then enter conversations with clients that used to be replace my old boiler with a new boiler. Now the conversations are really interesting. The demand is replace my old failing boiler with a non-fossil fuel source system. Find a different way to provide me the thermal energy, do it cost effectively, and let's create the return on investment. That level of demand in the career that I've had uh, continues to remind me that for as long as I've been involved in this, I feel like we've just begun the passion, the excitement, the, the interest, the desire, and then clearly the demand uh, from our clients is very, very high. Um, and, th and thank you for letting me part of the, be part of this panel. Great. I love hearing that positivity coming from demand side as well as the supply side. And, and we've got to give credit where credit's due. We've got to celebrate achievements. And we've got some bragging rights on this panel right now because folks, get in here from Infosys. You've already got there. You're already carbon neutral. You've done it decades, two decades ahead of time. How did you manage to do that for Infosys? Um, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, so um, you are right. Um, we uh, just two weeks ago, uh, we uh, announced that we are carbon neutral and we are carbon neutral across all three scopes of emissions. And uh, we would see um, a lot of companies targeting only scope one and two. And uh, we have achieved carbon neutrality across all three scopes of emissions. And how did we do it? Um, obviously we were on this journey a little longer than many other companies. Uh, this has been a decade long um, journey for us. Uh, we actually started our um, um, climate action in 2008. And then in 2011, uh, we made a commitment we will turn carbon neutral. And um, we focused on energy efficiency, transition to renewables, and um, high quality offsets to achieve this. And so I guess uh, we are happy to be carbon neutral. So we are not only really one of the first signatories to the climate pledge, and we are first off the block being carbon neutral. So very happy to be carbon neutral. Where next? Where next on the ESG roadmap then? How do you keep committed to it? So yeah, that's the other good thing, you know. So along with our carbon neutrality announcement, we have also announced our 2030 um, ESG vision, where we have upped our ambitions across the board. Um, including we are taking a 30% reduction target for our scope three emissions in absolute terms. I see. So we've got just ongoing commitment, ongoing extension, and also really COVID. interesting the way in which COVID potentially has impacted that and people working from home, people flying less, but how you net that all off and the measurement. And in terms of measurement and in terms of action now, Kara, back to you in terms of the multifaceted way in which Amazon is tackling this. We already heard in way in which Schneider Electric is looking at its vehicles. I know that's something that already Amazon is committed to. Where else are you seeing the most opportunity and some of the most biggest challenges in terms of ensuring that Amazon can be carbon neutral? Yeah, absolutely. We are looking across, uh, as, as both and other have, have mentioned, uh, all three of our scopes, and we're looking at how we first and foremost, decarbonize our operations. So how do we make real business changes to um, understand where that's happening within our company? So we've built a carbon system of record. Um, we spent multiple years building that so that once we launched a commitment like this, our operators would have a deep understanding of the information and not only be able to see where carbon uh, was occurring within our operations where those kind of most impactful, um, you know, kind of 
pieces of our business were, but also where their decision making could be changed. What would happen if they were to make a different decision? So electrification of fleet is a great example of that. We've ordered 100,000 electric vehicles from Rivian um, that will all be on the road by 2030. And uh, they'll start in 2022 and um, you know, be executed along with Mercedes-Benz. We've ordered 1,800 electric vehicles in Europe um, and Mercedes-Benz has signed on to the Climate Pledge as well. We've established, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a critical invest also in a longer term in decarbonizing technologies and think about you know, what can we seed right now? Uh, we established a Climate Pledge fund with an initial $2 billion in funding. And that's really to support those visionary companies that are developing the products and services of the future that will help to facilitate this transition. And we announced our first five investments there um, in Carbon Cure and Pachama, Redwood Materials, Turntie Technologies. So these are things that address our built environment to some extent, um, but also the investment in, in natural climate solutions. So we're looking again across those carbon intense parts of our businesses and thinking what are the changes that we need to do now on fleet, on buildings, uh, in our data centers, and then we're looking ahead and saying, what can we do to think about, you know, what is needed with these different technologies? We've also created uh, a research group internally that um, we did a number of years ago, which has been researching from a scientific point of view and putting some scientific rigor uh, behind how we look at our business and how we think about our e-commerce business and what we understand about that. Um, and we're sharing more about what we're finding both uh, for our cloud computing business and our our e-commerce business, which are both, uh, you know, what we think are better alternatives to, for example, shopping in a physical store um, or having on-prem servers. So we are looking and providing information, engaging with the academic community, engaging across multiple different uh, stakeholders, certainly partnering with groups like We Mean Business and Race to Zero and TED Countdown to really share as much information as possible, both about how we're doing this um, but also, I think, uh, you know, has been pointed out on this panel that it's a process and we're learning what is going, what's going to be needed um, and where are some of the most stickiest problems that we can attack with science and investment. I love the way in which you bring up stakeholders and you talk about also the decision making process that has to go across the whole business down the chain of command. And to that point, Martin, how are you finding that? in particular at Siemens, the decision-making process and, and making sure that employees are along for the ride, that they're completely committed to this as much as it is coming from a top-down, it's actually coming from a bottom-up perspective as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, uh, just in the US alone, we have 280 sites. These are offices and big manufacturing facilities. So, you know, we need to empower our employees in those very local places to really act on uh, plastics and recycling, um, increasing biodiversity of our green spaces. Um, and our view is you, you've got to plant a thousand flowers and, and hope they all bloom, really get the best ideas and, and grow them uh, and replicate them elsewhere. But of course, like others have, have said on the panel, we have big central programs rolling out uh, distributed energy solutions on our, on our big sites. We're putting uh, energy efficiency measures uh, in, in them all as well. And, and you know, post-COVID, you know, the whole world is going to be thinking about how we save money on energy bills. We're going to get back to the, the McKinsey curve, the very famous abatement curve where we're putting in insulation properly. But this is our time to combine those measures with real innovations, keep going to, to the right on this curve. Um, and you know, we, in our Princeton facility, we put a distributed energy solution in, we put solar in the parking lot, we put energy efficiency measures everywhere, we connect it to our um, IoT platform so that we can learn and replicate this across other buildings and energy share. Uh, and do, just, you know, we have to, to do all of these extra things and, and share that information. So again, you know, having a group like this, our combined knowledge is going to allow us to do uh, much more, but but there are so many employees in our company that just want to be involved. Um, you know, it's a question of pointing them in in the right direction, getting them involved in something they really want to be doing, um, and just seeing how that grows. So it's 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 exciting times. Good to hear that employees want to be doing it. What about mm. at Schneider Electric? 
Olivier, what are you seeing in terms of suppliers wanting to get on board with this? Is there a little bit of pressure that you have to exert? Are they willingly wanting to take your lead and see the climate pledge and, and raise their game as well? Yeah, you know, interestingly, I was telling you in the first example on our own operations, we have experimented a lot on ourselves that we bring now to a customer. On the supplier side, the interesting part, actually, we've started to do a, a lot of, uh, of jobs with uh, the, the, an entity that we have in the US, which is called Energy and Sustainability Services. And it has started with the first program we've done for Walmart for their supplier. And that was very interesting. And Walmart was coming to us and say, look, we have a large number of suppliers in the US. They are small, medium-sized company, and we don't know somewhere how to help them really to go through this sustainability journey. And actually, we designed this program to Walmart, which was to create a kind of ecosystem, a pool, and uh, to make sure that those small, medium-sized companies, they can have access to PPA, they can have access to the latest technology. So now back to your question, we've learned from that experimentation that we've done for Walmart for their supplier to apply exactly the same program now at Schneider that we are going, by the way, to disclose uh, next week. So we are basically creating a program where we target our top 1,000 supplier, not necessarily the biggest in size, the, but the most CO2 intensive in their operations. And are, actually, we are creating an ecosystem where we, we give them access to the latest technology, latest service provider, to have more access to renewable, more access to PPA in general, and to make sure that we can help them now. That's nice to say, but the commitment we take is that for those 1,000 suppliers is to help them to divide by two their CO2 emission in the next five years, because we strongly believe that everything has to be measured. So we are right now, when we speak, baselining 2020 with them and uh, taking that commitment again to offer those solutions and to get through that journey together. So we believe, and you said it, I think, in your introduction, it's not only about what each company can do, but also how we can create ecosystem. And I think the large company have this also the responsibility to help both small, medium-sized companies everywhere in the world who don't know usually where to, to, to get started. But again, more, more to come in the coming days. Ash, you were earlier talking about building ecosystem, about how the demand is certainly there, but you can't, you can't build your way to a more carbon neutral society. You have to retroactively fit it, which is what your business is doing. But what are, can you educate us to some of the biggest challenges that you found in doing that? Is it about education? Is it about getting parts? Is, is it, what has been some of the biggest tough, tough calls, but also the triumphs? Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me let me give you some thoughts on both those. I, I I do want to just maybe go back to a question you asked earlier. Just a quick comment. We are finding just uh, just as an FYI that our people are demanding um, that we focus on climate and mm -hmm. climate change. And as a matter of fact, I I just don't think we could hire the best in the industry if we hadn't made such a commitment, um, and, and if it wasn't part of the DNA in our fabric. So I just, I wanted to just offer that comment that I just think that the workforce today, particularly, uh, I don't know if it matters generationally, but I think it's a, I think it's something that we should just be mindful of. In terms of the biggest challenges, well, the built environment industry, the industry, the architects, engineers, contractors, operations and maintenance. And here's, here's something that I think, you know, maybe those that are part of the industry may not like me saying, but I want to say it out loud. We have lost productivity over the last 15 or 20 years. So this is the problem. The problem is that it costs too much to do these things. We are not very effective. We're not very uh, efficient generally at how we deliver. Um, and I think you know, that that's something that the industry has to face up to. And I think one of the reasons we joined is because we are so looking forward to having deep discussions on new ways uh, from a supply chain perspective, new collaborations that need to happen. So therefore, one of the biggest challenges that our clients face is that they're trying to teach kids, heal the sick, graduate nurses, engineers, serve their citizens. This is what they're trying to do. So then they, get, they become concerned that, yes, of course, they want to decarbonize. They want to go deep energy efficient. And they want to do it as expediently as possible. But they're not sure if it's going to cost them focus and how much can they actually afford to do? That, that's one of the biggest opportunities. And so the opportunity then becomes, how do we deliver that work in the most effective way possible without obviously uh, removing their focus, enhancing their mission, finding different ways of not only 
alternative financing. You see, sometimes when we talk about PPAs and alternative financing, it's good, it's important because they don't have the capital. But if the cost to deliver is more expensive than any other way of delivering, then it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work well for school districts that are already struggling. So we have to do a twofer. We, we have to both make these projects deeply affordable, high quality, and sometimes we have to put together the financing that allows there to be a return on investment. The opportunity is there. That can be done, but it's going to require that we come together differently as an industry and we think differently about the way we put projects together and think, to be blunt, more like an Amazon um, in terms of how they have thought differently about their supply chain. Um, but ultimately, you know, the concerns that clients have are understandable, but I am so encouraged that the opportunity to come together and find different ways of doing deep retrofits, driving to zero carbon in the built environment is just right there. It's right before us, cost effective. And I know that as an industry, we can, we, we can have a, quite an impact to create a balance between the built and the natural environment. Um, but there are some challenges that we have to overcome. I fully appreciate any of you taking up previous questions that you've heard and adding your sense, putting your perspective in there. I love that what you say about your employee base, Ash, but also the way in which you're spinning it forward and looking towards, you know, mere culpa moments saying that you need to drive for efficiency right now. There isn't enough there. And therefore taking it to Bose, I mean, data services, what you provide inherently is about efficiency for the companies, the clients in which you have. Where are you seeing the challenges that you've had to get already to carbon neutrality you are a business that puts an awful lot of people on planes for example that's all ended in 2020 to a large degree but where are the challenge where were your biggest areas of of inefficiency when it came to the climate and how were you able to think about it differently um so actually um, in this decade long journey we had quite a few challenges and i'm going to talk about two or three of them um when we started off like Many other companies find we found um, lack of data. We didn't have enough data to really draw any um, insight to, to make any uh, meaningful decision. So one of the things that we have done early on is to invest in uh, metering everything. And that progressed to a level that today, um, in the office that I go to work every day, we have set up a command center, which connects to almost 50 million square feet of office space across India. Everything is uh, thousands of smart energy meters and water meters and weather monitoring stations and everything is hooked up to that station. Everything is monitored live. Everything can be managed uh, remotely, controlled remotely. And that has given um, uh, rich data and uh, a lot of opportunities for efficiency. And um, on energy efficiency front, um, the achievement that we have had over the last decade, our employee strength grew by over 150%. But our absolute energy consumption went up by only 20%. And that's how well we controlled our um, energy requirement. So the um, data problem that uh, we overcame. Um, the other challenge we com continue to face is our um, transition to renewable energy. Um, again, we have um, 50 million um, of, um, square feet of office space and data centers um, spread across this country. 90% of our footprint is in India. And um, while we have a commitment to transition to 100% RE and we are willing to invest, spend the money, uh, go the mile, there are a lot of restrictive policies um, that are holding mm -hmm. us back. So today we are about 50% renewable power and we are trying hard and um, hopefully, you know, the policy landscape will um, um, enable us to get there soon. 
on that policy, oh, that policy you are sure. of course in an emerging market how have you learned from being in a developing market how has it been within india it sounds like actually red tape is still an issue whereas you might have thought that was more something that was an issue for developed markets what do you think can be used it, it, it is a very complex issue and it's a very um local issue and it has to do with um, uh, power sector has been under government control for a long time and it's been inefficient for decades and a lot of the power distribution companies um you know the, the core problem is actually the power distribution companies through which we have to get our power uh, they have been in um, losses accumulated losses of you know actually billions of dollars and companies like us or any big company we are the cash cows for them you know so whenever we want to i mean they are not in a position to procure and supply renewable power to us directly so we have to go to third parties get into a power purchase agreement get that power wheeled through the infrastructure owned by the government and deliver it to us um so in that process you know we are part of cutting them off i mean we will use only the grid but in the financial transaction we are cutting them off so um they are losing that big cash flow and that that's a big problem for them so um a lot of restrictive actions and measures coming um because of that and that's a big challenge it's a very local um, um issue and it's um, it is probably it has nothing to do with uh, being in developing country or um you know and people are aware of it and mm-hmm. um and I, it, it will probably take some time to you know straighten things out Kara of course Amazon works across developed and developing countries and making inroads into India but focusing of course with a lot of regulators and policy makers in the US but wherever you have your footprint how have you been seeing the differences in where you are look where you are based how, where have you seen best practice Yeah it's a great question I mean we want to provide you know our signals that we want all these kinds of um enabling technologies particularly if you think about a clean energy market um where we operate we want to be able to have as much uh clean power on the grids wherever we're looking to operate around the world uh we have a similar commitment to 100% renewable energy by 2025 um and we already have about 90 plus projects um across the globe but i think the point is very well taken that we have an opportunity to come together collectively to really send that very strong signal and get behind each other to say we need um enabling a policy environment we need an enabling regulatory environment to um have greater access to renewable energy um everywhere that our companies operate um across the collective uh, voice of the pledge um and particularly in communities that historically have not benefited from clean energy offerings i think that that's a really important point as well we can extend a lot of these things that we're building for um all of our companies operations into the communities um we want you know where the people where uh who are are working for for us or any one of these companies uh to benefit in their community from increased access to renewable energy increased energy efficiency options increased electrification charging infrastructure. So I think that we have a critical role to play in the development of these types of infrastructures, the development of these enabling policy opportunities. We know um you know that is sort of especially coming out of this pandemic moment, um investments in these things are going to be uh bending cost curves, they're going to be uh, inviting more access Um I think a lot about you know even the airline industry which has um uh, obviously been hit very hard in the pandemic moment um and we took an action um you know to really signal because there was availability of sustainable aviation fuel right now because it's not being utilized by the airlines we wanted to make sure that we continue to signal that demand so uh we like to use our air business as an enabler of that uh sustainable aviation fuel production uh we put a, an order in for about 6 million gallons um to signal that we're prioritizing bringing uh this these kinds of fuels into our operations they're not at the cost curve that we'd like to see yet 
But I think by signaling those kinds of things, us and many other companies that are saying, we, we, this is the direction that we're going and it's going to be how we decarbonize our, the carbon intensive parts of our operations. Um, and I, you know, I, I just would say add one thing, which is our employees, uh, I think all of us feel so strongly about the involvement of our employees. We have an Amazon ambassadors group um, over 6,000 employees have joined that group to really take individual actions within each of their roles at Amazon. So it's really spread like wildfire throughout our company and people are giving us solutions and ideas from all over the world and from each of their communities every day, which is super exciting. Cara, of course, sustainability has been in your life's work. Amazon, amid the dark cloud of COVID, has had a great silver lining in terms of you've been the right business at the right time to serve a purpose in this moment but and, and benefit from it. But have you been surprised or what's been surprising about the continued commitment to climate when we are facing so many other sudden crises? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I think, you know, certainly our focus has been first and foremost on the health and well-being of our employees and our customers and keeping everybody as safe as possible. Um, and our internal operational focus on, you know, making process changes uh, to put those kinds of safety practices and items into place has been uh, the primary focus of our company during the pandemic. Um, however, we see the looming climate crisis, it has not gone anywhere. We cannot take our eye off a longer term uh, vision that we have still the ability to implement, you know, solutions to this. And I think that's where the optimism part comes in, right? We still have a bit of time. We can't take our eyes off you know, even in the moment that we're in and everything we need to do to keep people safe and to help them get the products and services that we need. And our, our company, I feel very, you know, lucky and proud to be working at a company that's played a critical role in, in providing access to those services. What I want to do is, is to help us do that in the most sustainable way possible. So I think those two things go hand in hand. Um, it's good for everybody. It's good for the health of the communities where we operate, that we're not only focused on that immediate health and safety picture, but the, you know, the health and safety of better quality of air, better access to renewable energy, all of those things go hand in hand. And they're, they're part of how we will and will continue to operate. We have not taken um, any of our eye off of that. And I feel, you know, again, it's been incredible to see the investment that we've made, but also the, the momentum of the climate pledge and how many companies are interested in saying, you know what, yes, this is the moment where we wanna come in and commit all the companies that are here today on this panel, the fact that they're able to get that kind of high level commitment from their companies in a year like 2020 is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And speak to the leadership of these companies that they are uh, long term visionary companies that they are dedicated to this in a really true way. Um, and they've not been, you know, they can handle multiple priorities as we all need to, quite frankly. And certainly as a Seattle based business wildfires and and the climate crisis has been front and center for you in 2020 as well i'm sure and martin we were talking just a moment ago about policy making and and regulatory environment if you had one wish of course if you were back in boris's ear if you were talking to the new administration in the us for example what would you be asking for i'm a i'm a big fan of mechanisms i think you know a carbon price would be fabulous um I'm a big fan of cap and trade schemes. Uh, the state of New York are doing amazing things on building energy efficiency so that the, you know, the overall footprint comes down year on year. Um, things like congestion pricing and low emission zones have, have proved to work, get people out of cars and clean up the cars. Um, but they can also be a bit of a distraction. You know, I think strong policy uh, that encourages more innovation in things like distributed energy and energy efficiency is really going to be key in the next few years. Um, I'd love to see a little bit more of that. Um, I think every big city should have an energy master plan. Uh, I think the world is changing so significantly around the way our buildings are now mini power stations. They are no longer big consumers of energy and they're connected to a much bigger system. Um, and an energy master plan would ensure a very smooth transition to electric vehicles and ports and harbors and airports and, and everything else that's, that's slowly creeping into the electrified world. So those kind of policies, um, I think sometimes we chase big things uh, and we should just keep that incremental improvement uh, going. And just one other 
point I'd like to make on the on the Paris Agreement, um, you know, rejoining for the US will be a, a, an amazing step. Mm. Um, I love the fact that London Heathrow expansion was rejected on the grounds of it not complying to the Paris Accord. This was Christiana's hard work really coming to fruition because that should be a real wake up call um, that Ash mentioned, you know, architects, engineers, construction companies, developers have to now think hard right at the beginning of what they're gonna build, how they're gonna do it, what they are creating, and is it truly sustainable? Uh, and I think that's also gonna have a really wonderful impact. So um, I'd love to see a few more big schemes like that being rejected on those grounds to uh, allow people to sort of see into the box and, and understand more fully what they have to do to move forward. Above about to have a few moments left. Olivier, what excites you about some of the big projects that you are seeing, that you are, you're of course France-based, Europe's predominantly, but a global electronic, electric equipment powerhouse. Where are you seeing some of the most innovation right now? Well, look, to keep it short, I would say there are really three crucial areas in the decarbonization journey. I would say number one, electrification. Uh, only 20% today of the world energy is, is electrical and we need really to enhance at least towards 40% of total energy mix in 20 years. Of course, many people know what can be done with electrical vehicle, but that, that goes really beyond the electrification of mobility through heating, cooling, and so on and so forth. So first of all, electrification. Point number two, I talked about it and some people mentioned it also, it's about decentralized energy. Uh, the world energy mix will decarbonize and will go step by step based on a lot of more renewable energy. But in 2019, only 20% of the deployed renewable capacity came from large utility scale, which means that the renewable energy is being adopted step by step to, to create also decentralized energy system with microgrids, as we said before, and, and also distributed generation system will have a much bigger impact thanks to the battery technology, which is getting uh, more and more mature. So certainly so decentralization. And last but not the least, obviously, uh, digitization, because digital technology today play a major role you know, in reaching decarbonization, having real-time information of installation and super your, you know, computing capabilities allow really to enhance efficiency really, real time. So for instance, in our case, our, what we call a construction resource advisor software, offer this kind of technology where you not only connect to your system to get the data, but that bring to you artificial intelligence assisted services that really increase significantly. So the, the three common points, probably of my three points, the, sorry, the one single point, which is common to the three is really technology. What is very different today compared to five, 10, 20 years ago is one of course the focus that all organizations in the world have on decarbonization. So there is an appetite to do more, but I would say even more important than, than that, I think the technology are now mature to make it happen. We are all technology companies now. I don't think a single one can claim that they aren't in that sort of horizontal in some way. Ash, your perspective lastly on what you'd wish for from a government. You're so steeped in public sector in terms of hospitals and where in which you're providing for schools. What would you ask in terms of policy making? Yeah, well, let me, let me just give you three very quick things. The first is that local, state, and federal government need to continue to lead the way relative to deep energy efficiency in their own buildings. It would be great to see the public sector adopt 100% zero carbon public buildings approach by 2030. Um, and I think that this kind of wide scale program will catalyze continued massive market movement, you know, including innovations technically, financially. I think these are the kinds of actions that, um, I, I, you know, I don't feel bad putting the, the pressure on government because I don't think we can deal with executive orders or toothless policies anymore. I think we just need to see action. So that's one area. The second is that, you know, we need to treat energy efficiency as energy generation. You know, energy efficiency seems to be kind of this cute thing that sometimes people think is a good idea. And of course, everyone says it leads the way. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's not really dealt like a true measurable, dispatchable energy resource. That has to change. Um, and then the last piece here that I think is actually very critical and may may run a little different uh, thinking, 
the utilities that exist, particularly in North America, and I'd say particularly in the United States, uh, continue to be critical to the decarbonizing of all infrastructure, buildings, uh, the EV uh, that we need to deploy. And so the relationship between utilities, building owners moving past the meter, and then building owners and occupants past the lease, those relationships that have been in place for so long need to be transformed. They need to change. Utilities need to do more past the meter. Building owners have a deeper responsibility to engage their occupants, their students in the realm of sustainability. So we have got to change some of the underlying relationships and those DMZs just will not allow us to get to the most expedient, most effective partnerships that we're gonna to need to decarbonize, not just the built environment, but also the transportation environment. So those three areas, local, state, federal government really stepping in, think about energy efficiency as energy generation, and then realign those relationships between utilities, buildings, buildings, and occupants. I think if we really focused on those practical pieces, we're gonna make um, some real difference happen very quickly. Thank you. It is all about relationships. It is all about collaboration. It is all about us coming together and hearing your wealth of expertise across this panel. I, I was lucky enough to be the person sent out to Paris when this agreement, COP21, was, was signed. And the euphoria at that moment, I'm so glad to see, is still being driven into real action right now. And thanks to the Climate Pledge. Christiana Figueres is back with us to really seal up what has been a very optimistic conversation, but one with real call to action, I think, still. Christiana, please do take it away, the co-founder of Global Optimism. I'm unmuting again. Impossible to um, be able to summarize a very rich discussion. Let me just pull a couple of threads. Kara started us off by reminding us that everything we do has to be science-based. And we, from there we start and then we go into ambition and acceleration and we use our corporate scale to build corporate ecosystems that will actually take us to where we need to get to on time. But she also reminded us later on that this is a path, it's a process. There's no perfection, but there has to be constant improvement. Olivier then uh, reminded us that where we start on this path is with our own footprint, measuring use of our own electricity, our fleet, and then move up to experimentation and innovation to take much better responsibility of our own footprint. Bose then told us, actually, you can be carbon neutral now, uh, and even uh, issues such as lack of data can be, uh, can, can, can be addressed by digitalization and big data management and optimization of big data, which are technologies that are available to us right now. Martin then moved us to say, and beyond our own footprint, beyond our own direct influence, let's collaborate with cities because that is the way that we go to scale. And Ash um, reminded us that this is actually systemic. This is not about a, a one corporation or one city. This actually is, we have a convergence of crises, hence we have to converge the solutions systemically. Now, the bottom line for everyone is what is the theory of change? What the theory of change we used to think that um, the biggest lever in business is sales and the biggest lever in politics is votes. And there was a chicken egg discussion, chicken and egg, which comes first. The fact is they both have to come together in order to get us to the scale and speed of transformation that we need. Sorry that this is so brief, but we're going to be cut off. <laughs> Christiana, thank you very much. What a wonderful discussion. Thanks to all our panelists, and we wish you a wonderful rest of the day, whether it be morning, evening, or afternoon. Thank you very much indeed.